This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One, Chapter Six The Shoemaker. "'Good day,' said Monsieur Defarge, looking down at the white head that bent low over the shoemaking. It was raised for a moment, and a very faint voice responded to the salutation, as if it were at a distance. "'Good day.' "'You are still hard at work, I see.' After a long silence, the head was lifted for another moment, and the voice replied, "'Yes, I am working.' This time a pair of haggard eyes had looked at the questioner before the face had dropped again. The faintness of the voice was pitiable and dreadful. It was not the faintness of physical weakness, though confinement and hard fare no doubt had their part in it. Its deplorable peculiarity was that it was the faintness of solitude and disuse. It was like the last feeble echo of a sound made long and long ago. So entirely had it lost the life and resonance of the human voice that it affected the senses like a once beautiful color faded away into a poor, weak stain. So sunken and suppressed it was, that it was like a voice underground. So expressive it was, of a hopeless and lost creature, that a famished traveler, wearied out by lonely wandering in a wilderness, would have remembered home and friends in such a tone before lying down to die. Some minutes of silent work had passed, and the haggard eyes had looked up again, not with any interest or curiosity, but with a dull mechanical perception beforehand that the spot where the only visitor they were aware of had stood was not yet empty. "'I want,' said Defarge, who had not removed his gaze from the shoemaker, "'to let a little more light here. You can bear a little more.' The shoemaker stopped his work, looked with a vacant air of listening at the floor on one side of him, then similarly at the floor on the other side of him, then upward at the speaker. "'What did you say?' "'You can bear a little more light.' "'I must bear it if you let it in,' laying the palest shadow of a stress upon the second word. The opened half-door was opened a little further, and secured at that angle for the time. A broad ray of light fell into the garret, and showed the workman with an unfinished shoe upon his lap, pausing in his labor. A few common tools and various scraps of leather were at his feet and on his bench. He had a white beard, raggedly cut, but not very long, a hollow face, and exceedingly bright eyes. The hollowness and thinness of his face would have caused them to look large under his yet dark eyebrows and his confused white hair, though they had really been otherwise. But they were naturally large, and looked unnaturally so. His yellow rags of shirt lay open at the throat, and showed his body to be withered and worn. He and his old canvas frock, and his loose stockings, and all his poor tatters of clothes, had, in a long seclusion from direct light and air, faded to such a dull uniformity of parchment yellow, that it would have been hard to say which was which. He had put up a hand between his eyes and the light, and the very bones of it seemed transparent. So he sat with a steadfastly vacant gaze, pausing in his work. He never looked at the figure before him, without first looking down on this side of himself, then on that, as if he had lost the habit of associating place with sound. He never spoke without first wandering in this manner, and forgetting to speak. "'Are you going to finish that pair of shoes to-day?' asked Defarge, motioning to Mr. Lorry to come forward. "'What did you say?' "'Do you mean to finish that pair of shoes to-day?' "'I can't say that I mean to.' I suppose so. I don't know. But the question reminded him of his work, and he bent over it again. Mr. Lorry came silently forward, leaving the daughter by the door. When he had stood for a minute or two by the side of Defarge, the shoemaker looked up. He showed no surprise at seeing another figure, but the unsteady fingers of one of his hands strayed to his lips as he looked at it. His lips and his nails were of the same pale lead color and then the hand dropped to his work, and he once more bent over the shoe. The look and the action had occupied but an instant. "'You have a visitor, you see,' said Mr. Defarge. "'What did you say?' "'Here is a visitor.' The shoemaker looked up as before, but without removing a hand from his work. "'Come,' said Defarge. "'Here is monsieur, who knows a well-made shoe when he sees one. Show him that shoe you are working at. Take it, monsieur. 
Mr. Lorry took it in his hand. "'Tell Monsieur what kind of shoe it is and the maker's name.' There was a longer pause than usual before the shoemaker replied, "'I forget what it was you asked me. What did you say?' "'I said, couldn't you describe the kind of shoe for Monsieur's information?' "'It is a lady's shoe. It is a young lady's walking shoe. It is in the present mode. I, I never saw the mode.' I have had a pattern in my hand. He glanced at the shoe with some little passing touch of pride. And the maker's name, said Defarge. Now that he had no work to hold, he laid the knuckles of the right hand in the hollow of the left, and then the knuckles of the left hand in the hollow of the right, and passed a hand across his bearded chin, and so on, in regular changes, without a moment's intermission. The task of recalling him from the vagrancy into which he always sank when he had spoken was like recalling some very weak person from a swoon, or endeavouring, in the hope of some disclosure, to stay the spirit of a fast-dying man. "'Did you ask me for my name?' "'Assuredly I did. One hundred and five North Tower.' "'Is that all? One hundred and five North Tower.' With a weary sound that was not a sigh nor a groan, he bent to work again, until the silence was again broken. "'You're not a shoemaker by trade,' said Mr. Lorry, looking steadfastly at him. His haggard eyes turned to Defarge as if he would have transferred the question to him, but as no help came from that quarter, they turned back on the questioner when they had sought the ground. "'I am not a shoemaker by trade?' "'No, I was not a shoemaker by trade. I—I I learnt it here. I, I taught myself. I asked leave to—' He lapsed away, even for minutes, wringing those measured changes on his hands the whole time. His eyes came slowly back, at last, to the face from which they had wandered. When they had rested on it, he started and resumed, in the manner of a sleeper that moment awake, reverting to a subject of last night. I asked leave to teach myself, and I got it with much difficulty after a long while, and I have made shoes ever since." As he held out his hand for the shoe that had been taken from him, Mr. Lorry said, still looking steadfastly in his face, "'Monsieur Manette, do you remember nothing of me?' The shoe dropped to the ground, and he sat looking fixedly at the questioner. "'Monsieur Manette,' Mr. Lorry laid his hand upon Defarge's arm, "'do you remember nothing of this man? Look at him! Look at me!' Is there no old banker, no old business, no old servant, no old time rising in your mind, Monsieur Manette? As the captive of many years sat looking fixedly by turns at Mr. Lorry and at Defarge, some long obliterated marks of an actively intent intelligence in the middle of the forehead gradually forced themselves through the black mist that had fallen on him. They were overclouded again, they were fainter, they were gone, but they had been there. And so exactly was the expression repeated on the fair young face of her who had crept along the wall to a point where she could see him, and where she now stood looking at him, with hands which at first had been only raised in frightened compassion, if not even to keep him off and shut out the sight of him, but which were now extending towards him, trembling with eagerness to lay the spectral face upon her warm young breast, and love it back to life and hope. So exactly was the expression repeated, though in stronger characters, on her fair young face, that it looked as though it passed like a moving light from him to her. Darkness had fallen on him in its place. He looked at the two less and less attentively, and in his eyes in gloomy abstraction sought the ground and looked about him in the old way. Finally, with a deep, long sigh, he took the shoe up and resumed his work. "'Have you recognized it, monsieur?' asked Defarge in a whisper. Yes, for a moment. At first I thought it quite hopeless. But I have unquestionably seen, for a single moment, the face that I once knew so well. Hush, let us draw farther back. Hush. She had moved from the wall of the garret, very near to the bench on which he sat. There was something awful in his unconsciousness of the figure that could have put out its hand and touched him as he stooped over his labor. Not a word was spoken, not a sound was made. She stood like a spirit beside him, 
and he bent over his work. It happened at length that he had occasion to change the instrument in his hand for his shoemaker's knife. It lay on that side of him which was not on the side on which she stood. He had taken it up and was stooping to work again when his eyes caught the skirt of her dress. He raised them and saw her face. The two spectators started forward, but she stayed them with the motion of her hand. She had no fear of his striking at her with the knife, though they had. He stared at her with a fearful look, and after a while his lips began to form some words, though no sound proceeded from them. By degrees, in the pauses of his quick and labored breathing, he was heard to say, What is this? With the tears streaming down her face, she put her two hands to her lips and kissed them to him then clasped them on her breast as if she laid his ruined head there. You are not the jailer's daughter? She sighed, no. Who are you? Not yet trusting the tones of her voice, she sat down on the bench beside him. He recoiled, but she laid her hand upon his arm. A strange thrill struck him when she did so, and visibly passed over his frame. He laid the knife down softly as he sat staring at her. Her golden hair, which she wore in long curls, had been hurriedly pushed aside and fell down over her neck. Advancing his hand by little and little, he took it up and looked at it. In the midst of the action he went astray and, with another deep sigh, fell to work at his shoemaking. But not for long. Releasing his arm, she laid her hand upon his shoulder. After looking doubtfully at it two or three times, as if to be sure that it was really there, he laid down his work, put his hand to his neck, and took off a blackened string with a scrap of folded rag attached to it. He opened this carefully on his knee, and it contained a very little quantity of hair, not more than one or two long golden hairs, which he had in some old day wound off upon his finger. He took her hair into his hand again and looked closely at it. It is the same. How can it be? When was it? How was it? As the concentrated expression returned to his forehead, he seemed to become conscious that it was in hers, too. He turned her full to the light and looked at her. She had laid her head upon my shoulder that night when I was summoned out. She had a fear of my going, though I had none. And when I was brought to the North Tower, they found these upon my sleeve. You will leave me, them. They can never help me to escape in the body, though they may in the spirit. Those were the words I said. I remember them very well. He formed this speech with his lips many times before he could utter it. But when he did find spoken words for it, they came to him coherently, though slowly. How was this? Was it you? Once more, the two spectators started as he turned upon her with a frightful suddenness. But she sat perfectly still in his grasp and only said in a low voice, I entreat you, good gentlemen, do not come near us, do not speak, do not move. Hark, he exclaimed, whose voice was that? His hands released her as he uttered this cry, and went up to his white hair, which they tore in a frenzy. It died out, as everything but his shoemaking did die out of him, and he refolded his little packet and tried to secure it in his breast. But he still looked at her, and gloomily shook his head. No, no, no. You are too young, too blooming. It can't be. See what the prisoner is. These are not the hands she knew. This is not the face she knew. This is not a voice she ever heard. No, no. She was, and he was, before the slow years of the North Tower, ages ago. What is your name, my gentle angel? Hailing his softened tone and manner, his daughter fell upon her knees before him with her appealing hands upon his breast. Oh, sir, at another time you shall know my name, and who my mother was, and who my father, and how I never knew their hard, hard history. But I cannot tell you at this time, and I cannot tell you here. All that I may tell you here and now is that I pray to you to touch me and bless me. Kiss me, kiss me, oh, my dear, my dear. His cold white head mingled with her radiant hair, which warmed and lighted it, as though it were the light of freedom shining on him. If you hear in my voice, and I don't know that it is so, but I hope it is, if you hear in my voice any resemblance to a voice that was once sweet music in your ears, weep for it, weep for it. 
If you touch, in touching my hair, anything that recalls a beloved head that lay on your breast when you were young and free, weep for it, weep for it. If, when I hint to you of a home that is before us, where I will be true to you with all my duty and, and with all my faithful service, I bring back the remembrance of a home long desolate while your poor heart pined away. Weep for it, weep for it. She held him closer round the neck and rocked him on her breast like a child. If when I tell you, dearest dear, that your agony is over and that I have come here to take you from it and that we go to England to be at peace and at rest, I cause you to think of your useful life laid waste and of our native France so wicked to you. Weep for it, weep for it. And if, when I shall tell you of my name and of my father who is living and of my mother who is dead, you learn that I have to kneel to my honored father and implore his pardon for having never for his sake striven all day and lain awake and wept all night because the love of my poor mother hid his torture from me. Weep for it, weep for it. Weep for her then and for me. Good gentlemen, thank God. I feel his sacred tears upon my face and his sobs strike against my heart. Oh, see, thank God for us. Thank God. He had sunk in her arms and his face dropped upon her breast. A sight so touching yet so terrible and the tremendous wrong and suffering which had gone before it that the two beholders covered their faces. When the quiet of the garret had long been undisturbed, and his heaving breast and shaken form had long yielded to the calm that must follow all storms, emblem to humanity, of the rest and the silence into which the storm called life must hush at last, they came forward to raise the father and daughter from the ground. He had gradually dropped to the floor and lay there in a lethargy, worn out. She had nestled down with him, that his head might lie upon her arm, and her hair drooping over him curtained him from the light. If, without disturbing him, she said, raising her hand to Mr. Lorry as he stooped over them, after repeated blowings of his nose, all could be arranged for our leaving Paris at once, so that from the very door he could be taken away. But consider, is he fit for the journey? asked Mr. Lorry. More fit for that, I think, than to remain in this city so dreadful to him. It is true, said Defarge, who was kneeling to look on and hear. More than that, Monsieur Manette is, for all reasons, best out of France. Say, shall I hire a carriage and post-horses? That's business, said Mr. Lorry, resuming on the shortest notice his methodical manners. And if business is to be done, I had better do it. Then be so kind, urged Miss Manette, as to leave us here. You see how composed he has become, and you cannot be afraid to leave him with me now. Why should you be? If you will lock the door to secure us from interruption, I do not doubt that you will find him when you come back as quiet as you leave him. In any case, I will take care of him until you return. Then we will remove him straight. Both Mr. Lorry and Defarge were rather disinclined to this course, and in favor of one of them remaining. But as there were not only carriage and horses to be seen to, but traveling papers, and as time pressed, for the day was drawing to an end, it came at last to their hastily dividing the business that was necessary to be done, and hurrying away to do it. Then, as the darkness closed in, the daughter laid her head down upon the hard ground close at the father's side, and watched him. The darkness deepened and deepened, and they both lay quiet, until a light gleamed through the chinks in the wall. Mr. Lorry and Monsieur Defarge had made all ready for the journey, and had brought with them, besides traveling cloaks and papers, bread and meat, wine and hot coffee. Monsieur Defarge put this provender and the lamp he carried on the shoemaker's bench. There was nothing else in the garret but a pallet bed, and he and Mr. Lorry roused the captive and assisted him to his feet. No human intelligence could have read the mysteries in his mind, in the scared, blank wonder of his face. Whether he knew what had happened, whether he recollected what they had said to him, whether he knew that he was free, were questions no sagacity could have solved. They tried speaking to him, but he was so confused and so very slow to answer that they took fright at his bewilderment and agreed for the time to tamper with him no more. He had a wild, lost manner of occasionally clasping his head in his hands that had not been seen in him before, yet he had some pleasure in the mere sound of his daughter's voice and invariably turned to it when she spoke. In the submissive way of one long accustomed to obey under coercion, he ate and drank what they gave him to eat and drink, and put on the cloak and other wrappings that they gave him to wear. He readily responded to his daughter's drawing her arm through his, and took and kept her hand in both his own. 
They began to descend, Monsieur Defarge going first with the lamp, Mr. Lorry closing the little procession. They had not traversed many steps of the long main staircase when he stopped and stared at the roof and round at the walls. "'You remember the place, my father? You remember coming up here? What did you say?' But before she could repeat the question, he murmured an answer as if she had repeated it. Remember? No, I don't remember. It was so very long ago. That he had no recollection whatever of his having been brought from his prison to that house was apparent to them. They heard him mutter, 105 North Tower. And when he looked about him, it was evidently for the strong fortress walls which had encompassed him. On their reaching the courtyard, he instinctively altered his tread, as being in expectation of a drawbridge, and when there was no drawbridge, and he saw the carriage waiting in the open street, he dropped his daughter's hand and clasped his head again. No crowd was about the door, no people were discernible at any of the many windows, not even a chance passer-by was in the street, and a natural silence and desertion reigned there. Only one soul was to be seen, and that was Madame Defarge, who leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. The prisoner had got into a coach, and his daughter had followed him, when Mr. Lorry's feet were arrested on the step by his asking, miserably, for his shoemaking tools and the unfinished shoes. Madame Defarge immediately called to her husband that she would get them, and went, knitting, out of the lamplight through the courtyard. She quickly brought them down and handed them in, and immediately afterwards leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. Defarge got upon the box and gave the word, "'To the barrier!' postillion cracked his whip and they clattered away under the feeble overswinging lamps under the overswinging lamps swinging ever brighter in the better streets and ever dimmer in the worse and by lighted shops gay crowds illuminated coffee houses and theater doors to one of the city gates soldiers with lanterns at the guardhouse there your papers travelers see here then monsieur the officer said defarge getting down and taking him gravely apart these are the papers of Monsieur inside, with a white head. They were consigned to me, with him, at the... He dropped his voice. There was a flutter among the military lanterns, and one of them being handed into the coach by an arm in uniform. The eyes connected with the arm looked, not an every day or every night look, at Monsieur with the white head. It is well. Forward, from the uniform. Adieu, from Defarge. And so, under a short grove of feebler and feebler overswinging lamps, out under the great grove of stars. Beneath that arch of unmoved and eternal lights, some so remote from this little earth that the learned tell us it is doubtful whether their rays have even yet discovered it, as a point in space where anything is suffered or done, the shadows of the night were broad and black. All through the cold and restless interval, until dawn, they once more whispered in the ears of Mr. Jarvis Lorry, sitting opposite the buried man who had been dug out, and wondering what subtle powers were forever lost to him, and what were capable of restoration, the old inquiry, I hope you care to be recalled to life? And the old answer, I can't say. End of Book One, Chapter Six Recorded on February 17th, 2006 by Jamie Osborne in El Paso, Texas. Thank you.